Hi everyone and welcome to the latest issue of the Watch Development Logs. In this issue I'm going to show you a couple of new features which have been added to the version 0.4.14 uh, which uh, kind of provide you some new ways to interact with an aggregation. And The first feature is uh, something I'm really excited about and is this ability, the ability of using the aggregation graph that is now stored into uh, each aggregation to compute all the sequence of rules that have been used to generate an aggregation and then use that sequence of rules to recreate the aggregation either with uh, different parts which share a similar topology to the parts we used or with the same parts which can be uh, deformed in different ways before then aggregating them. And the second feature is going to be a small addition that I've add, made to the part catalog, which is the possibility of making it adaptive and hence uh, be able to change its probabilities given the amount of parts that have been already added in an aggregation. Let's get started. If you uh, download the files that you can find in the description of this video, you will find uh, two separate files, one that demonstrates the part catalog, and we'll see that in a moment, and another one which demonstrates this ability of extracting rules from an aggregation. And what you'll find in this file is, if I for a moment hide Rhino, is we have two parts which are very different. So we have an hexagonal prism and an L-shaped block, and both of them, they have some sort of window uh, shape which we have. But what's interesting about these parts is that if we go and visualize the connections, oops, these parts have the same amount of the connections and also they have those connections which are um, organized in a similar way, meaning that they have one connection at like six connections on the side and then they have one connection at the bottom and one connection at the top. And that's exactly the same if we look at our hexagonal prism. So it has six connections on the side, one at the top and one at the bottom. So, of course, if we aggregate those parts, we get very different results. So if you can see here, if I use my, my hexagonal aggregations, and instead if I use my L-shaped aggregations, I'm going to get very different results. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to see if we can take an aggregation that has been created using one of these two uh, parts and then extract the sequence of rules that have been applied and also like to which part have been applied and to which connection and see to how we could recreate the ag an aggregation which has the same exact topology but using a different part. And then we're going to also see how we can instead use the same part, so we're going to create it with the hexagonal prism and keep the hexagonal prism, but we could deform this hexagonal prism and make it into something different. So let's try. So what we're going to start by doing is we're going to go in our rules tab and get this new component which is called rules from aggregation. We can bring it in and connect it to our the output of our stochastic aggregation. And what this component is going to do if you place a panel to take a look on it is that it's going to run through our aggregation and using the aggregation graph it's going to compute and extract the set of rules uh, that have been applied. And you'll notice that these rules look a bit a little bit different uh, from the rules. And if you haven't watched the graph, graph grammar aggregation video, I'm going to put a link for you uh, for taking a look. But these are graph grammar rules. So they look like a WASP rule. So you see the first one is fundamentally a WASP rule. But then they have a second part with what it's doing is it's assigning IDs to each of the parts. So in this case, I'm saying take an X apart, attach another X apart to it, and then name the first one zero and the second one one. So after we did the first part, the first side of the rule will not use anymore the X type, but will use an ID to call one of the parts that have been already placed in the aggregation. So you see that the difference here is that this compact rule allows us not only to describe the sequence of rules, but also on which parts and on which connections within the aggregation these rules have been placed. So what it means is that we can use these rules without any other input to recreate an exact copy of this aggregation. So let's do that. 
And so to do that, we are going to go to aggregation and get the graph grammar aggregation component, which has now been moved from the experimental tab to the aggregation tab, as it has been tested quite a bit. There might be some small bugs still, but it's mostly working. And then we're going to, for example, take our hexagonal part from here, plug it into our part, and we are then plug our rules from the grammar rules into it. And as we are regenerating it every time, this time we are going to, instead of using a button, we are going to use a toggle and set it to true and connect it to reset. Maybe move it a bit down. And if now I take my part out from here and I connect them to the uh, visualization section that we have here, you'll see that the result is exactly the same. And if I would go on and reset my aggregation, this will automatically recreate those aggregation using those rules. Now, not that interesting to simply recreate the same exact aggregation uh, like going through a couple of more components. But what's the power of it now is that we can do two things. So the first thing is, and we're going to see how to do that, is we can edit the geometry of this part, keeping all the connections and everything the same, but start, for example, to scale this in some way. And then by running through this aggregation, the aggregation will be regenerated using the new part. So let's try to do that. And so what we are going to do is we are going to go under parts and get a transform part component and we are going to connect our basic part to the part input of this and then we have to come up with some kind of uh, transformation that will change the geometry of this part so for example I'm going to use a scale non-uniform so scale and new and what this component does is it's going to scale this geometry, but it's going to allow me to control the scaling factor in each direction, so in x, y, and z, uh, independently. So it's not simply making the geometry bigger, but it allows me to deform it in different ways. So for doing that, we need a plane. And we are going to get that by using a volume component and connecting this to our base part geometry. So we're going to get it there and connect it to our volume. And this is going to return us the centroid of our geometry. And then I'm going to create three sliders, which I'm going to set, for example, to 1.2. And I'm going to create three copies of them and connect them to X, Y, and Z. If I now take the X output, which contains the transform information and plug it into transform, and I'm going to, for a moment, hide my aggregation. And I'm going to now go to get part geometry. You'll see that, of course, right now the geometry is scaled uniformly. And that's because these sliders are all the same. But if, for example, I would say that I would want the uh, Z to be 0 0.8. And, for example, I'm going to keep the Y to 1. And bring the X to 1.5. You'll see that my aggregation gets, like my part gets scaled in a way in order that it's not anymore. So now if you would simply go and apply the same transformation that you applied to the original part to this part, the aggregation would simply not match anymore because the connections that are on these faces would just not be in the same place. However, since now we have the aggregation rules, what we can actually do is instead of uh, simply using the transformation, we can actually recreate the aggregation by using this new transform part as our base part. Since the part has the same name as our original part, we don't need to do anything. But if I now go and visualize the output, you'll see that what happened is that my aggregation has been recreated by, by scaling all this geometry around. And I can simply go and start playing around with the different sliders. And this will allow me to create a variety of different aggregations by exploring different uh, scales. Now, of course, um, 
there's going to be collisions, as you can see clearly, and that's something that right now it's not uh, controlled by the graph grammar aggregation because the graph grammar aggregation aims at simply recreating exactly the sequence. So I might implement some collision checks in the future, uh, which will not stop the aggregation, but which will give you a warning that there are some connections. However, already with this one, you can do a lot of things because one of the great things you could do with something like this is you could start, for example, running um, optimization algorithms that would allow you to change the geometry of your part while maintaining the topology constant in order to achieve uh, specific goals. And I'm also planning into uh, going further and allowing you to change the rule sequence, but that's something that it's a little bit more complicated. Now, here we see how we can change the geometry, and that's pretty cool. But what if, instead of simply modifying the geometry of an existing part, I would want to create, recreate the aggregation using, using a completely new part? So, the one thing you have to make sure is that these parts have the same topology, which means that uh, they have the same number and the same uh, type of connections. So in this case, you'll see that my part has another completely different geometry, but it also has 10 connections, which is exactly the same number of connections that my original part has. So what I can do is I can take my part, and I know that my part is not called X anymore, but it's called L block, and I'm gonna take it and plug it into my um, graph grammar aggregation. And of course, what my graph grammar aggregation will tell you is that, well, that's not working because my rules tell me to look for exa parts, and what I'm getting is parts which are called L block. But what we can do here is we can replay, we can tell the aggregation to this uh, rule from aggregation component to extract the, um, the rules and then replace the name of one part with the name of another part. So in this case, my, my old part name was exa, And my new part name was L block. So if I now do this, you'll see that the rules get updated and they get updated to the name of L block. And what I'm now creating here is an aggregation that internally shares the same exact topology, so it's followed the same exact sequence of the previous aggregation, but it uses a completely different part. Now, of course, this is an extreme case, and for obvious reasons, since the two parts are very different, they cause uh, a lot of collisions and overlappings between the part, but you can imagine that you could use this one to create parts which are slightly different, which have, for example, different openings and so on, and you could very quickly recreate the same aggregation and test which of the different parts would be the best suited to create that specific aggregation. So this is uh, a brand new feature, and as I said, it's still kind of experimental, so there might be still some issues here and there, but I really think it's gonna be something really powerful, and it's gonna be something that should start to enable WASP to be used uh, more consistently into a different kind of optimization uh, algorithms, where you can cycle between different part types or between different part geometries, and explore how the changes at the part level will affect the uh, aggregation level without actually changing uh, the aggregation sequence. So let me know what do you think, uh, try it out, see if that fits into your works and so you can always join the Discord channel which has a link below and feel free to come in and share your ideas and your thoughts with what could be done. The second feature that I would like to show you is a small addition that I've made to the part catalog in order to allow to make it much more accurate, particularly when working with um, fields. So if you download the file that you can find in the description, you will find uh, a simple aggregation, which we have seen already in the previous, uh, in I think, development log six. and this is a simple field aggregation that follows this gyroid-like structure and which is made of three parts and which has a part catalog that allows to control the amounts of uh, each part. And so 
by default, you'll see that the quantities are all set to be uh, equal. And you'll notice that the part catalog has a new input. And this input is uh, the uh, adaptive input. So what it means for a catalog to be adaptive is that by default, you set the catalog when working in proportional mode, so not in limited mode. And what this catalog does is it, re it calculates a certain probability based on the inputs that you give, but then those probabilities are kept fixed during the whole aggregation. Now, um, this is okay in most cases. However, particularly when you're working with fields, you might have noticed that the, uh, the amounts are very often very much different, particularly when there is a big difference between the amounts of one part versus the other one. And the reason for that is that those probabilities are never changed across the aggregation, but they keep staying, staying fixed. And so other uh, aspects such as the number of connections or the number of rules come to impact the occurrence of one part over the other one. So what we can do now using an adaptive input is that we are telling to the part catalog to use those probabilities, but also every time a new part is added in the aggregation, update the probability of uh, that part to be added. So if there are more parts of one type which are already placed in the aggregation, the probability of that part will be lowered in order to make sure that the final result is uh, consistent with what we're doing. So we can, for example, test that by changing the, the amount of parts. So for example, if I would say that I would want 100 hexagons and let's say 20 of both uh, the triangular prisms and the cubes. If by default I have my adaptive input set to false, I will reset my aggregation. And you will notice that the difference between those is actually pretty big. So we see that these proportions are very much different from the proportion that I've set here. And the reason for that is that since the hexagonal prism has more connections, and it has, it's easier to be placed, it kind of takes over. And so even though it has a lower probability, it has always had higher probability of getting placed. And so it by default becomes more. So if we change the, the, the input and set it to adaptive and now reset our aggregation again, you'll see that still you have some areas where the hexagons take over but you now see that the proportions that are given by this thing resemble much better the proportions that I've been setting here. Let's try once again. So you can see that once again, it's not perfect and that's because there are a whole set of other factors happening in there and these are just taken as probabilities and not as fixed numbers. However, you see that the number that we get is much closer to the kind of proportions I've set. So you can see how using this adaptive part catalog allows you to highly increase the accuracy of uh, the aggregation that you are creating using the uh, a field driven aggregation. And what you might also have noticed is that since now we have a part catalog that inputs a set of probabilities, the field driven aggregation is not deterministic anymore, but it also has a stochastic um, character. And so whenever we reset the aggregation, we get different results which followed even though the inputs are the same. And so what I'm going to be doing in, an up in the next release is I'm going to allow you to fix the random seed in the field driven aggregation so that you could use this one to explore um, different outcomes from the same input parameters. So that's it for this video. Uh, if you enjoyed it, uh, subscribe to the channel and also click the notification bell. I'm gonna keep releasing new videos uh, illustrating the new features of WASP and I'm also working on a brand new tutorial series for WASP which will integrate WASP with the Weaverbird plugin and allow you to model organic mesh geometries using WASP. So thanks for watching and see you in the next tutorial.